This is Ashley Davis, and you're listening to the Bigfoot Club podcast. Hey guys, please go to our website at www.bigfootclubpodcast.com. Please check out our bios, please buy some merch, and you can listen to all our old episodes. Also, check us out on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find us by typing Bigfoot Club number one. That's Bigfoot Club, the number one. Also, if you have any strange stories or if you just want to reach out to us, please email us at BigfootClub, the number one, at gmail.com. Also, check out Matt Knapp's Bigfoot Crossroads. He is on all platforms. Hey everybody, Robert Jesse Dominguez, Bigfoot Club, Season 4, Episode 26. I'm here with my nephew, Steven. Steven, say what's up. What's up? What's going on with you this week, man? Uh, <clears throat> nobody's sick. That's uh, good. We're, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 uh, we're good this, this week. The boys are good? Boys are good. Bla- uh, Blair's good? Blair's good. Is she back to drinking again? She's back to drinking, man. She's back to <laughs> being the abusive uh, spouse. No, I'm just kidding. She doesn't. She doesn't drink. It's a joke. It is a joke. It's um, a joke. I'm pretty excited today. I uh, we're in. We have in today Scott Harriet. Uh, Scott, welcome to the club. Oh, thanks, man. And uh, uh, sorry, I guess about your your wife drinking, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott. If you have any, uh, I don't know if you have any uh, pointers on that. Uh, uh, just uh, maybe, you know, leave little AA pamphlets around the house. Just uh, maybe she can find those, uh, you know, or, or, or get a movie that where you have a character gets really drunk all the time and like kills people, and yeah. you know, and just like, honey, why do you want? Why did you want to watch this film? I'm like, honey, just watch. Yeah. Just kinda, yeah. Why do you want? Why do you want to watch Dahmer for? Ah, just, just, just watch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. See that that six pack right there? That's the second six pack. I'm just we we have this <laughs> running joke, Scott, where we always talk about you know because she she clearly doesn't drink, but she's actually she's actually sober. She she I mean but, she would occasionally drink, <laughs> but yeah. we it was just a, a me being yeah. exaggerated on one joke and it just kind of carried over to every episode. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, she's like, I don't drink anymore. <laughs> for God's sake! For it's God's pure, sake! It's pure heroin now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, yeah. Hey, hey, Scott. I wanted to tell you, man. Thank you for reaching out to me because, like, I because you reached out to me, and I was already a big fan of yours already because oh. I was telling so you you're that. The one. Yeah, <laughs> you're the one. Because, like, I I had I had found your DVD, uh, squatching uh, the journey into Squatchedom. Oh, journey towards Squatchedom. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the combo I, of those. I bought that like in like in the nineties, uh, late nineties, wow. and I think I was like in my twenties. It was like my first time buying something with my own money with Sasquatch wow. stuff. So I was I was like, cool. and I know were you were you at the Texas Bigfoot conference? Mm-hmm. I was. Yep, I was. Like I think the last one I went to <clears throat> was like two thousand five. Okay, and um, I think I went to a couple before that as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cause yeah, I, I think that's that's where we saw your because I bought your video and I know Stephen, my nephew, saw the video there because I was I was a part of the Texas Bigfoot Research Center at first. Oh, cool! And then I left them, but then I mm-hmm. I kept I kept going back to the conference. And Stephen, mm-hmm. Stephen, what do you what do you what do you recall about that? Uh, I, it was my first uh, conference. I, I think I was eleven, twelve. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah, I was eleven or twelve, and I was excited. This is the great. This bleeds into the great red fusion throw up story. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was excited, and uh, I just remember. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this too because I've always, I've always expressed this to my uncle, and I was like, "Hey, who is that? That guy that that showed us that video where you know he was crying, and there there was like a bigfoot, yeah. like just, just kind of like just." Uh, swaying. That's the word I was like. Yeah, swaying back and forth, and he was all like, "I remember that, but I, I, I'm I'm trying to remember the name." And then he eventually told me, "I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I remember." Out of all the people that that spoke, yeah, and I spoke, and then I actually met Lauren Coleman and all that. Like, yeah. I just remember that that one stuck with me. Yeah that that yeah, that was a that was a trippy day, dude. God, I can't believe it's going to be thirty years. On, uh, come this October twelfth, thirty years ago that wow. that happened. Yeah, it it it's still, um, you know, 
what was it, six years ago I made a film called A Squatchalypse Now. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> very original. I, I, like, got, I, just, I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, available at squatchfilms.com, by the way, folks. And um, it, it, the film is primarily about a new trail, because I do a lot of hiking films, too, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I thought as part, it, it, there's a new trail, relatively new trail in Northern California called the Bigfoot Trail. They just kind of, this guy, um, I forgot his name, but he put together this, like, 350-mile route that goes through some really super remote, beautiful, and really difficult hiking areas, and I thought it would be a good idea to make a film about that. But I also thought it would be interesting to go back and interview Daryl, who the guy who was on the hill with that day, who had the the, the actual VHS camera. <clears throat> you know, he, he had a VHS, I had a high 8 camera, and I just wanted to know how he felt about that 24 years later, again, this being six years ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, he... he he believed as much now as he did then, and, and uh, so do I. I mean, I just, what I saw, and, and um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would bet every dime I've ever made, which isn't a ton of dimes, but uh, I, I, in, in, that's why I tell people, I think in all probability, 99.9% that I was within not just one, but, but two of these creatures known as... Uh, Sasquatch or Sasquatl or Bigfoot or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would, Scott, did that did that get you started down that down that road of doing? Because I know you were doing like you were saying you were doing like hiking videos. Were you hiking and then eventually saw Bigfoot and then you kind of got into? No, it? no. See, that was ninety two. I I was at the time. I had the worst profession of anybody who's serious about Bigfoot. I was a working stand up comic. Okay. I uh, because you know I would start I would start talking to people about Bigfoot, and you know I, I'm kind of a joker, and they it, it, half the people are you kind of expecting a punchline at the end of what I'm telling them, right? But um, no, I I've been into it since I was a kid. I remember my dad bought me um, one of John Green's books mm. in the you know right around uh, late '60s, early '70s, called Year of the Sasquatch. And I was a pretty pretty big reader when I was young. Uh, I did well in school, and I just I just something about Green's writing was always very just kind of down to earth, and it kind of got me hooked. And you know, Patterson film, all that stuff, and I just always had an interest in it. And then in the late '80s, I went to an area in the Southern Sierra. I don't know how I got. Oh, I remember how I got back into it again. I was. I, I graduated from Cal State Northridge in like 82, right? Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I went to the library back there again in like 86 or something, 85, 86. And I was blown away by the fact that in the science library at Cal State Northridge, they had this book by Green called Sasquatch, the Apes Among Us. And I was just impressed by that, again, that it was taken seriously enough that it was in, in the science library. So I remember checking it out and reading it and just devouring that book and that guy. So then I ended up finding out about some areas in the southern Sierra where some screams had been heard, and I went there and I heard some bizarre screams, man. I mean, just do I know it was a Bigfoot? No. But I've never heard anything remotely like it since. And then it just kind of it just continued. And then the thing we were alluding to earlier <clears throat> about – that's going to be 30 years ago come this October, was right around the time that uh, sound blasting was becoming popular. And again, this is pre-internet, right? This is just, you know, I I had heard of like Matt Moneymaker. I knew uh, Daniel, don't call me Danny Perez, um, who's been in it a long time. And uh, and I had ended up, do you guys want to hear the story? Should I tell that? Is that? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I, I always try to condense it, but I, this kind of begs questions if you don't. So I'm into call blasting, right? I think that would be a cool thing to do. So Willow Creek, you guys know Willow Creek, right? There Absolutely, in California, yeah. Right? And so it's a kind of a Bigfoot town, and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's no business-wise, it's that. And, and, but there had been a history of a lot of sightings in that area over the years that Green had documented. So I called the uh, information center there, which was actually a booth, 
And I was curious if whoever was there would know about either a mule or a horse packer in the area. And uh, because I wanted to, like, go back in the woods for two or three weeks with a bunch of, like, small stadium speakers and blast some purported Sasquatch screams like the Puyallup tape Mm -hmm. and maybe hopefully get a hold of some uh, gorilla cries or orangutan and just see what would happen. So I called, and this lady picked up, and I talked to her, and I didn't tell her right away it was into Bigfoot, you know, and I asked her about horse or mule packers, and she said, no, I don't, I don't know of any in this area. And then I just asked her about Bigfoot. I, what, what do you think about that whole thing? She goes, well, I've lived here all my life. And she goes, personally, I'm, I'm skeptical. But she goes, it's really weird you, you asked me this, uh, because a guy just called here yesterday, very emotional, very bent out of shape, saying that his son and his son's friend about 30 miles away on the coast near the mouth of the Klamath River had come running back to the house saying they'd seen this approximately six-foot-tall, light-colored, ape-like creature just staring at them up on an embankment. Uh, They were down in a dry creek uh, bed looking for snakes. So I'm like, wow, that's cool. So, hey, do you happen to have the guy's number? And she goes, yeah, hold on. I get, and she said, I don't think he'll mind. I mean, because apparently, and as I talked to Daryl later, he just thought Bigfoot was BS. You know, he said, oh, it's a local legend. And they hadn't lived there very long. But he had re- he repeated to me several times about, look, I know when my son's BSing me. And he was super serious about it. And the kid he was with, a neighbor, was also seemed genuinely shook up and excited about what they saw. So <clears throat> I told I got on the phone, talked to Daryl. He told me the whole story. After about a half hour I talking to him, I just felt, man, it sounds like there's something to the story. It just, it doesn't, it, it seems improbable that they mistook it for something else based on what the story was. But I wanted to talk to the kids themselves. So I think within 48 hours of when they actually had the sighting, I got in my car, I was living in L.A. at the time, picked a buddy of mine up on the way, drive 700 miles up there because I want to get their ASAP, right? Wow. And so we interviewed these kids. And my buddy Dan, he's definitely more skeptical about Bigfoot than I was at that time. Just kind of adds, yeah, I don't know. And so we interviewed the kids separately. And there was no contradictions between their stories. They both came off very believable. One was 12 years old. One was 8 years old. And again, basically what they said was that they were in this dry creek bed about a quarter mile away from the house in this little valley. Um, If anybody's ever up there, if you go to, uh, if you're on Highway 101, just north of um, the Klamath River, there's a road called Hunter Creek Road. And if you take a right on that road and go down about a mile, and then you look to your right, and you'll see this really a very steep, densely vegetated row of hills. And there's a huge tree. You can't miss it. It's, it's still there. That's, um, that's the hill or at the base of that hill. That's where the kids had the sighting. So we interviewed them separately. Very believable. So it was like, well, well, well what, what now, if anything, to do? So <clears throat> as it turned out, uh, I was due back up in that area about three weeks later to do, again, the worst profession to be in if you're in the Bigfoot. I was doing some stand-up gigs up in Oregon and Washington. So I thought I could come back and, you know, or we talk on the phone, Daryl and I, and see what, 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 if anything, could we do to investigate further. Well, he finds out, first of all, he finds out, yeah, there has been a lot of sightings in this area. He talks to people and they go, oh, yeah, people think, some people think it's really real. And, and it, I can't emphasize enough that some of these hills, I mean, it's like Vietnam, dense. You get a lot of rainfall, very densely vegetated. It's very, very steep hills. So he finds out who owned the land behind where these kids said it was staying. By the way, I'll tell you specifically what the kids said were that the 12 year old and the eight year old were looking for snakes. They were about roughly, I don't know, 50 yards apart approximately. And the one kid just looked up and about a hundred feet away from him, he said, just standing there on the embankment, maybe back a few feet was this heavily muscled, a hairy, but not super hairy, light colored, like gray, beiges colored, ape-like thing. Arms like a human, legs like a human. 
And the only thing that was moving, they both said this, that was one of its arms was just moving slightly, just just kind of swaying. They didn't feel threatened by it, but, you know, the, the kid who saw it first, the 12-year-old, kind of called over to the other kid. He was trying to, you know, keep his voice low. And, Come over, guy. The other kid comes over. He sees it. And they looked at it for about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, and they kind of freaked out. I think it started running back toward the house. And I can't believe it, uh, or I can't remember if one or both of them said that as as it turned, as they started to run, they looked at it, it turned then and started walking back toward the base of the hill. Like it was like, oh, they're scared. Now I'm, I'm going to get it. It's about time to get out of here type of thing. Yeah. So we went to where they said it was standing. We did find, uh, in, again, it was like, uh, it was like a ferny, you know, n- there wasn't really any soil. But there was an imprint. It was kind of interesting, about the size of a big footprint. But it was so indefinite, you couldn't, you know, yeah. make heads or tails. But that was kind of interesting. Again, the most compelling thing was actually the veracity of the kid's story. There was there was nothing else around there as we went there that they could have mistaken it for, like a right. like a weird looking tree or a rock. It was kind of out in the open. <clears throat> That's you know so, that one detail you said about the one arm swaying. Yeah. I, I think that's super odd. <laughs> yeah, so. I think I think um, what it to me it strikes me is just like again I think I do think these things are real and I think you know mm-hmm. DNA wise are probably the closest things to us. But imagine like if you were just staring, you weren't quite sure. You know, you're looking maybe just a little, maybe it's a little nervousness on on its behalf. It's just kind of its arms, just kind of you know, just. Uh, even just a little bit or something. That's that's how I always envision what a theory could have been why why the arm was swaying. But so I got home and in those subsequent weeks before I went back up, the father and I talk what to do. He finds out again, remember this thing turned and walked toward this hill. Again, very steep, very densely vegetated. And he found out that at the base of that hill, going back a few miles, it's owned by this older couple that live in the area. So he found out who they were, and he went and talked to them, and um, he broached the topic to the lady and, and, uh, and told her what the kid said, and she just, like, apparently very matter-of-factly said, oh, yeah, we, we, we kind of know they're there, just like, mm. no big deal. Um, I met her, when I went back up, met her again with Daryl, and she said, yeah, we haven't had, we've lived here, like, 40 years Never seen one, but we had we had two Native American friends who each had like a nighttime road sighting, and we we find their um, stories compelling or their their character compelling enough that that they saw what they saw. So so what do we do? So and we and at the time we asked, uh, hey, would it be cool if we went up this hill? And they were they were t- totally cool. Go whenever you want. Just don't bring a lot of people. Don't bring any guns, please. You know, if these things are there, we don't want anything getting hurt. And so, as it turned out, the next day, and again, I I don't recall us telling them we were going up the next day. Again, you want to go through all this stuff in your head when you're looking back to say, well, you know, could you have been hoaxed and right. blah blah blah. So, plus this was an older couple too. So this, you know, so <clears throat> anyway. When you, so we go to the base of this hill, and then you immediate, pretty immediately get under a canopy. You've got various trees growing on it, and there's just a lot of uh, ferns and a lot of thistle, especially at the base of it. And we start up this thing. Now, I didn't, and I think Daryl felt the same way. We weren't like, oh, we're, we're, we're probably going to see something. Because if, you know, if you told me you saw a bear <clears throat> at point A, and then three weeks later, somebody goes, you go back. You're not really expecting to see a bear again. But you're, you're, you're keeping an eye out, right? Mm. So we go, we, we start up this hill. Daryl, as I mentioned, had a um, uh, VHS camera. I had a Hi8 camera. I don't know. You guys are probably too young to even know what that is. But yeah. it's, it was just a format. Um, <clears throat> so, And, again, the reason we had cameras, just in case, but the main reason we were going up the hill is because when you're in the valley and you look up at the top of this hill, you can see an old logging road, which runs across the ridge line up there. So we thought, let's just get to that old 
logging road, and maybe there will be some footprint evidence there to go along with what the kids said they saw. So there we go. We start up the hill, and it's steep. We're literally having to use the ferns to pull ourselves up at times. You know, you go left, you go right, you go to the left, and it's too steep. It's like too, too much dirt here to the left. And you go right, and it's, and it's too dense. I mean, like, we didn't have machetes or anything, but it was that jungly. So, as I mentioned before, at the top of this hill, there's a huge tree, probably close to 100, maybe even more, uh, 100 feet high. And that was our beacon. That's what we kept looking. You could see through the canopy as you look up the hill, this tree was wide enough. So if you didn't know exactly where you were, you could go, oh, wait, there's the tree over there. So now we'll head back to the left or the right or whatever. Keep going straight. So it takes us like an hour and a half to get up the hill. I mean, it, it was, and, you know, we're going slow and we're keeping an eye on it. It's, it's a really cool, very, very cool hill. Very, very lush. And you can see some faint deer tracks here and there, faint deer trails, but no evidence that there was any human had been up this hill in however long. Also wanted to mention at the base of the hill, there was also intermittent barbed wire that had probably been put up years before, and that some of it had rusted out and gone down. But that was, again, the obviously the property boundary, a part of it. So we get to the tree, roughly hour and a half, and at that point, the tree, the hill, after being, I don't know, about roughly 30 degrees, I'd say, which is fairly steep, uh, it starts to level out a bit. You get to the tree, and then the hill levels down, I would say, 10 to 15 degrees. Well, we get about 60 feet past that. Again, we know that if we keep going in a relatively straight line, we'll eventually hit this road. But we get 60 feet past this tree, and also it's just like a wall of vegetation, a bunch of rhododendron. And now, like, well, what the hell are we going to do? And as I'm standing there, all of a sudden I notice about 40 feet in front of me, low, like closer to the ground, uh, a darkness, which uh, most of which was shadowing because it was a tree that had fallen, right, that was there, and the under part of the log had kind of rotted out a bit. So there was like a dark, you have all this greenery, and so it just catches your eye. You know, you're seeing this darkness. So I'm looking at it, <clears throat> and all of a sudden I notice what pretty clearly looks like two pretty big brown eyes looking out of this at me, us, because we're pretty close together there. So it wasn't like immediate, oh, high squatch alert, because it was low, right? You're thinking, well... But it clearly, after just seeing it for about 15 seconds, it clearly wasn't acting like a bear. Bears leave. They don't scare you out. They, they, they scatter. Black bears, which are the only bears there in Northern California, they just take off. This thing was very, like, focused on. It was looking at us. And what was frustrating was that you see the reflection. The eyes appear to be brown. You know, I would say roughly probably three, two, two and a half, three inches apart. And it, it was just behind the shadow line, if you know what I mean. Like, another reason I didn't think it was a bear, like, if there was a snout on this creature, yeah, it would have kind of stuck out in the light, I think. But this thing was just hanging back in the shadow. Again, low down. So, again, not immediately jumping to any Sasquatchian conclusions or theories. And so, and then after about 30 seconds of looking at this, it started swaying very slowly, just like back and forth. So that confirmed it was indeed an animal. I mean, at first you're like, okay, could it be some weird reflection? They could now this thing, then it, was, it, it started moving by itself. So it, it is an animal. Now, at this point, as I recall, we weren't really freaked out or anything because it wasn't, we we're getting kind of vibe of, you know, danger or anything. There, and there was, quite a bit of stuff in between us and it. It was like we were seeing it through a little, a little, um, you know, passage through the vegetation. You could see it down there. And I videotaped this, and this is probably what I showed, and, and it was, we were interviewed on Ancient Mysteries about this, mm. and uh, they showed this video. And it's, 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 it's remarkably inconclusive. There's nothing conclusive about the video. It's just, because, it, well, and as you guys know with the story, what happens next is super trippy. Uh, so it was like 10 minutes. We're sitting there. 
And I remember actually saying, and Robert, you probably know the old Albert Osman story. Yes. Where, right. And he said the, the thing it kept saying to the, him when it when apparently it kidnapped him, he said it would go like Soka, Soka, Soka. That's what he says. It was the only thing it would say would be Soka. So, so I literally remember saying Soka, Soka. <laughs> you know, just throwing out anything, <laughs> which hopefully doesn't mean eat me right. or uh, uh, kill me or, or something. Or so, take me away. Or... or take me away, exactly. So we're doing all that. We're keeping, we're keeping, you know, low. And so then we decide, look, why don't we, there's some stuff in between us. And granted, we had no weapon. We had no pepper spray. But again, we weren't really feeling threatened. So we stood up. I was kneeling while I was shooting this. Stood up and took about one or two steps toward it. And that's when, uh, the eyes gave off starting at the center and then like uh, dilating. I didn't put this together till later, but I think what actually happened, but all you know is that this red friggin' glow just, you know, like thankfully it didn't make that noise. Right. Um, and it happened twice in about 10 seconds. It's kind of like it got, it was a tiny bit of red opened up red, 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 closed down and then opened again. And that stopped us because, dude, that was, like, freaky. Now, when that happened, and immediately after I changed my underwear, um, <laughs> the probability that this was, in fact, one of these things, for me, went up quite a bit. Because having read a lot of, you know, collected a lot of books on it, pro and con, y- you do have quite a few sightings of people reporting this bizarre red eye glow. Um, I, don't, I don't attribute anything supernatural to Sasquatch. I just, I think it's just an unclassified, uh, unclassified by us humans, uh, life form, probably a close relative of ours. Uh, but that was, it was freaky. I could see, it was understandable seeing this happen that if in fact it was one of these things, why people would lead to jump to conclusions like they're demons or they're whatever. Cause it was, I mean, what other animal? I mean, I remember doing Google research at the time and no other animal is known to give off a red glow, a weird red glow. Um, Krantz, Grover Krantz, theorized that, I think it was him, uh, that what, it, it all depends on the shape of the eye of an animal and how its shape and how big it is. Um, and that will determine largely how, what color of the spectrum gets refracted back, like when, the, when it starts, it, an eye starts to dilate. Um, and by the way, later I, you know, find out that it is a common thing amongst mammals. When they get scared, it's including us, our eyes tend to dilate uh, because that theory being it lets more light in and allows us uh, theoretically to see clearer uh, an, an impending potential threat. So, so that happens, right? The red eye glow that stops us dead in the tracks, in our tracks. And we're like, what? The, now, what the hell do we do? So I remember thinking for I don't know how long we thought, but it was just so weird. I thought, well, why don't we? I'll move to the right. If I go down to the right, Daryl, if you go left, because we were right next to each other. He's like looking over my shoulder as I'm shooting this. My my theory was that if I if we went. In opposite directions, maybe whatever this thing was 40 feet in front of us would think perhaps we were trying to surround it, and then it would get up, move, and the, we could see more of what it was. Makes sense. Yeah, right? So I get about 15 feet down to the right of Daryl, and I remember, I'm not looking back at it, but I hear him just kind of, ha, huh, you know, like he's getting emotional. And I look back, and he now he's taping with his VHS but now he's not taping it, he's taping up. He's like up at about, the, remember the hill goes up about a 10, 15 degree, but he's holding it like at about eye level, roughly, maybe even a little higher looking. And he's like, okay. And he's trying to do the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, explaining what he's saying. Like, Excuse me, it's right here. And then all of a sudden you see his finger come into the, he's, he's pointing with his left hand, like where he's telling people to look in the image. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this at the time because I can't see what he's seeing. You move three feet in this vegetation. Right. You can't see what you just saw. So all I'm seeing is Daryl freaking out, videotaping something. And so he videotapes for about 30 seconds. 
I can't remember if I crept back up there or if I if I remained still. And then once he stopped, I came back up. But by the time I got there, he was really emotional. There were tears in his eyes. He was like, dude, and he's whispering to me, it's right there. It's right. It's standing. like, oh, shit. And I'm like, I love it when I tell this story to people. People, why didn't you just walk right in there and look? I go, dude, no, no. it was, there was a palpable something in the air. And it's like, no, not a good idea. So I'm like, what do we what do we do now? Again, no weaponry. Right. We're way the hell up this hill. Uh, we both found that the kid's story had it had a veracity to it that told us. So I figured, you know, discretion being the better part of Valor, why don't we just get the hell out of here? Because I'm really curious to see this uh, video. So we start down the hill. We stop. We'd listen. We didn't hear anything come after us. We don't smell anything. Uh, besides my shorts, and uh, we we get down and we get down to the house and I pop the video in and I remember being pretty close to the TV. The TV was on the ground. The VHS, VHS machines over the side. They push this play and I'm looking. I go and I see his finger come in and I go, "What's he talking about?" Go, and then I remember thinking, "Oh, maybe he's just." Because we definitely saw these eyes, and they were definitely turned red, maybe he now his imagination is going wild. He's thinking he's seeing something. So, um, look at it, and I rewind it, and then I step back from the TV. You know, like some of you want to see something so bad you get too close? Right. Well, I stood back maybe, I don't know, roughly 10 feet away from the from the TV, and he played it again, and I remember very quickly, I go, holy shit. I just, like, looked away, and I remember kind of telling myself, okay, be objective, be objective, you're into Bigfoot, you believe these things are so, you know, let's every known explanation, let's go through, and I look back at the image, and there, about 30 feet in front of Daryl, is sticking out of the side of this rhododendron bush, a thick one, at about five feet is what appears to be this huge Schwarzenegrian, like mountain gorillian upper arm with like a bulging bicep, tricep, uh, a deltoid muscle. You know how the, you know the deltoid muscles, that shoulder muscle you see on mountain gorillas? Mm-hmm. One of those sticking out almost like a stormtrooper kind of thing, but it was clearly not. It was very fluid looking, and and so there it is. It's sticking out of the side. Of the, now, and then where, if there was an elbow, that is bent, and you can't see a forearm. The forearm would be behind this bush. So it's almost like whatever this thing was was trying to hide, but it's so big or whatever, the arm is sticking out the side, but it's remaining very still. So I'm looking closer at the video, and I'm like, okay, well, if that's what I think it is, it really looks like a friggin' upper upper arm. There's got to be there's got to be something like a head, and there, if you go up from the tip of that shoulder, where that deltoid is, at a 45 degree angle, at about six feet tall, you see this very smooth, chrome domey, same color as the arm, by the way, which is whitish grayish, on the video, again, the roughly same. matching what the kids yeah, saw. Yeah, I was going to say face. the same as the kids saw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, but where the face is. <clears throat> That is dark. And again, you got to remember it's VHS tape. Mm-hmm. And so it's not, you don't, I don't know, Daryl, I don't, I don't know why we don't see, I, I think part of it is that where the uh, brow ridge is, and the brow ridge to me pretty clearly protrudes. It sticks out. <clears throat> so it's kind of shadowing the face. And when you play the, play the tape again, twice within this, 29 second video you see this head tilt out once and then you hear Daryl react. Now now I understand Daryl's reactions. Right. Daryl sees this thing. As he explained that he said he was walking, he was, he tried to turn, remember I went to the right and then he, he was going to go left but he said he tried to go left and it was too thick so he turned back like toward me but as he was turning back toward me in his peripheral vision, he caught a view of, he described as like a human form sidestepping in the vegetation. Mm-hmm. 
and that's where we saw it freeze, and that's freeze, and that's where we brought up the camera and started videotaping. So, again, twice within that video, you see that head peer out, and then you that's where you see Daryl's react. Ah, uh, okay, excuse me. And then it goes, it whips back really quick, like very ninja like, looking. It's like its original position, and then a few seconds later, it tilts out even farther, and that's where you just Daryl goes, huh. You just hear the emotion in his voice, and, and the camera goes limp in his hand. And the, by that time, within a few seconds, I'm talking to him. Like, what? And he's like, it's right there. He's whispering to me. So. Yeah, didn't didn't you say to him, didn't you say, take it easy? Take it easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. you, can, you can hear me on the original, because at the time he's taping, I'm still, I'm a ways from him down yeah. to the right. Again, how far, I don't know. But you take it easy, take it easy. And, right. And so... The next day, we went back up the hill with two other people. Still no guns or anything, but we're figuring whatever was there is not there now. And we went back to the same spot where, where the eye were, there was nothing there. And then where this thing had been standing, there was nothing there. But we decided to keep going with the original plan of trying to get to the road. We felt a little more comfortable, two more people with us. And this stuff, in between where Daryl shot it and where it was standing, and, and about, I don't know, 15, 20 feet beyond, was really thick, dude. We had to crawl on our hands and knees through some of it. And as we're going through, I remember, again, I'd say this is roughly 15, 20 feet past where this thing was standing. I had to part this vegetation, and then all of a sudden, right there, is a, an approximately 25-foot wide, 15-foot high or long, wait, no, 25 feet long, 15 foot wide nest. Clearly some type of animal had, had nestled down here. Had ne- we went into it, and you sit in it, and I was reminded very quickly of like a mountain gorilla nest, mm-hmm. which tend to be the top, near the tops of hills. <clears throat> it's because it's a prime defensive position. You can hear if something's threatening from you, you from below, you can get out pretty and you have the advantage speed-wise to get out the back. So we sat in there a little bit. We're looking around, and I noticed at the base of this little nest area, there is a circle. It looks like a, like a circle in the vegetation. It looked like something or things had been crawling in and out of that. And if you went in that, and it bent down to the right a little bit, but it led right down to where that log was where we saw the eyes, right? Right. So right as we got to where those eyes were, it became pretty real clear to me, and I believed also to Daryl, there's no way that what he got on video with the shoulder and the head could have fit where this log, the log wasn't that big. So what I think, so people say, well, what if it was uh, it was a Sasquatch and then there was another animal you saw first? Like, well, what other animal's eyes go red? You're not going to, I think it was probably a young one. Right. And we had stumbled across, I mean, they had come into this area. The kids had caught a glimpse of mom, dad, or the big brother three weeks earlier, and they were hanging out on this hill. And we go back up three weeks later and uh, happen to run into them again. Maybe they were there and they, we, they didn't feel threatened. I don't know. We, you know, right. They liked it when we said soka, soka, so they didn't run. I, don't, I have no idea why. But maybe I don't know. We I, I don't we didn't I don't think we were we, we weren't st- we were trying to be relatively quiet, but we weren't stalking like we were hunting, which I think animals, other beings are sensitive to. Um, so, so um, when you take everything together, the history of the, the general area, the kids sighting, um, the uh, videotape, uh, seeing the eyes. The, the seeing the red eye glow in person, Daryl's video, which I think is the most important piece of this whole thing, um, and then finding the nest structure and some hair analysis that was done afterwards by a guy in the San Francisco Bay Area named Sterling Bunell. I don't know if he's a crackpot or what. I just know he exists and he has some primatological experience. But he did, he did an analysis of some of the hairs we found, and he thought, that they were probably primate hairs based on the internal structure, which were very similar to Bagagthrix and I think chimp, chimpanzee samples he had. And and he was, he was pretty clear in his opinion he didn't feel they were human hair. So you take that, 
the things I just mentioned. That's why I tell people I think in all strong probability that I was within 40 feet of two of these things 30 years ago. Can I say 100%? No. Right. But what, what, when I contemplate, you know, again, the hoax scenarios, it would be like, you know, Daryl would almost have to for sure be in on it. He'd have to have Sean Penn caliber acting skills. What did he, he rigged up something with, that, with eyes that lit up. And then he had a guy in a suit. And, you know, that becomes more ridiculous yeah, than it is. What, I, what I think it probably was. So You, you know what I, what I find fascinating is that they, they, didn't, they didn't find you all threatening. They didn't growl. They didn't, they didn't mm. bark. They didn't yell. They didn't scream. They just were just checking you out. And yeah, maybe. It, maybe I don't know, man. It, it was weird. I, I, I don't know why. Maybe because we weren't. Um, who was it? Um, I know DeHinden always had a theory or he hypothesized that these, these things can smell metal or they know right. guns or they may have seen us. Oil, oil inside I, of a barrel or something. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. And, and then, I mean, we did have these objects in our hand, these cameras, but I guess they maybe they they and I'm sure they had that the bigger one must have seen. I mean, obviously it was it was standing its ground, <clears throat> um, looking at Daryl. So. Um, so yeah, it was you know again, and, and I'm a I, I am a huge fan of the scientific method, and I completely 100 respect. So I you know I I get it. If anybody, well, I'm not going to believe it's a right part of a body or a body or DNA analysis, which would totally get that. You, you, you know, but I would just say to them, you know, anecdotal evidence is important as well. It's not as important as physical evidence, but um, yeah, so. I, I get it when I, when I tell the story. I just you know take it or leave it, but that that's what I experienced that day. Stephen, you're gonna say something? I was just gonna say how, how fascinating it is and how calm you were. <laughs> well, well, um, I mean, I'm pretty I, sure you I were terrible. No, I guess we were pretty calm. Um, well, yeah, no, I, no, I remember. <laughs> you know, you know what? It was creepy, dude. It was it was in that whole when tr- probably from the time Daryl started taping. To when he stopped taping, I remember I have never, and still to this day, I'm 63 years old, and in my adult life, I don't think I've ever been around another adult who was emitting fear like he was at that moment. He was, you know, there's some who have this theory that these these things can really, you know, screw with your head. It was using some type of, um, you know, like uh, I don't know, ultrasound or. Or pheromone or something. Yeah, that infrasound. 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 Right. Right. And um, so I, I, I don't, I don't doubt that could be verified one day. Something like that. But yeah, there was. And then also knowing the fact how far we were up this hill, or and, un, unverified. Or un, exact boy, that's a good lead in. Uh-huh. That film. Thank you. Because I think haven't I chewed most of my time up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that's the story, man. And it. It, uh, it was a great story because it, it it touched me. As like my as a Bigfoot researcher, like, like in my early twenties, and that was yeah, one of the cool. very first things I've ever looked at. And I was like, you were like a big inspiration to me, and uh, so I just wanted to tell you that. So, well, yeah. but we have it. You, you're not homeless or anything, are you? No. Going, actually. <laughs> no. No, no, no. He, uh, he, he okay. took care of me, so yeah. No, he we're okay, not, <laughs> we're not, okay. not homeless. But yeah, I, I like to piggyback off of what he said. Like, yeah. It, I remember, I remember just being there, and I was. It was really hot in that yeah. room with all those people, and I remember oh, yeah. we were just sitting down after like speaker after speaker. And as a kid my age, I was getting bored. Yeah, I was getting bored out of my mind. I was like, okay, I get, I get we're here and all that stuff. But then you came on, you were like just cut straight to the point, and you put the the video on, and and I remember just seeing that, and I was like, oh my god, this this is. Yeah. This is fascinating, yeah. yet I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's it's weird. It, it's when, when I've shown that video, I remember, and it was soon after that for, for you know several years, I showed it to a lot of people, and only like I can only remember one person who couldn't even see it. I, I, I honestly think he was a guy who had got so deep into UFO stuff, uh-huh. like he was so deep. I think his wife or something threatened to leave him, and he saw anything out of the ordinary, anything quote unquote paranormal. He just turned his mind off to. I, he couldn't even acknowledge that there was this 
uh, arm structure sticking out. I mean, he would say it could be anything. I mean, it can be anything. It's not a Cadillac. It's not. It's not a cantaloupe. It's not. It's a, that's yeah. anything. What, what, what a childish statement to make. What is it? It's clearly, in my opinion, if I if if, if I separated myself from this event, like I didn't know anything about it. And looked at this video. I said, "It's either a guy, either a guy in a suit, or it's one of these creatures. It what's, can't be." What's Arnold Schwarzenegger and, up there just uh, yeah. and, hanging out? Exactly. He was prepping for for Predator hey, Eight. Hey, Daryl, come here. I gotta tell you something. Oh yeah, wait a minute. That's right. It was five. Uh, it was five years before uh, Predator. So yeah, maybe he was researching. I don't know. <laughs> Probably. But, um, <clears throat> yeah. So that. Uh, oh, one little quick little side note. You know who's the guy who does the um, the missing nine one one stuff? Uh, Pilatus. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm kind of a half fan of his. I like that he's interested. But I don't know. I don't want to get too critical, but right, a little sloppy with some of his research. But that project, I think it was the Hoopa project, mm-hmm. right? So one, he he got permission to go into the Hoopa reservation to get stories from Native mm-hmm. Americans. I thought, oh, that, what a brilliant idea that is. And one of the stories that happened, oh, I can't remember what the time frame was. It was, I think it was within, at least within a five, six year time of when the thing happened to us. The person's, this, and this, again, the Hoopa Reservation is only like as the crow flies, you know, 20, 25 miles away. And this one guy described this one coming out and he said it was light colored and there was an outline in the book, the guy remembers what it would look like. It It was very, very close to what the outline of this thing looked like that was staring at us Right on, on the video. I always thought that was really interesting, that oh. it could have possibly been the same thing. The same this, one, yeah. This, this picture is actually <laughs> right. a celebrity now. <laughs> no. He's on a book. Yeah. He's, he's in a video. <laughs> uh, so, you know, yeah. He's a... Uh, so, if anybody wants to see, you know, it's, it's Daryl's tape, and so he's been kind enough to let me use it in squatching and in a squash ellipse now he never decided to put it out he didn't want to put it up on uh, line and stuff and I, that's cool that's totally cool i think some maybe some people have recorded over times but and i'm not saying this is a sales pitch i swear to god but right. if you are interested it, it is in both a squash ellipse now and uh squatching which i only have available in dvd but um and uh, a squash looks now you can download right and also dvd i think also blu-ray so that's that's where it's, it's squash films i've got i think I, I think i still have that dvd i i still have it because I, oh, cool, I, I need to get it yeah i have it i have it stored yeah. away in my storage area because i anyway i got a long story but anyway um yeah. scott we got to talk about unverified we we have to talk yeah. about that uh you directed wrote it executive produced it right yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Partially uh, produced. One of the producers on it. Uh, just look, look at my I, uh, IRA account to verify that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, it was. It was kind of well. Obviously, I've had a lifelong interest in this, and, and, it, and it is about it's Bigfoot related, and um, it kind of was came out of COVID. I, you know, uh, my girlfriend and I were you know just hunkered down like. Like a lot of people, I thought, well, you know, this seems like a good time. Why don't I try to write? I always wanted to, to write a script. And so um, I wanted to write a story that it, whose main issue had to do with uh, the kill or no kill issue. Right. And so I don't know if you guys had ever listened to it, but, I, you know, I co-hosted a podcast for years with Brian Brown and Sam Ridge called The Bigfoot Show. I think all the op- uh, episodes are still available on on Apple and other podcasts, but um, Brian and I would get in really heated discussions about the kid. And I am, I'm, I'm no kill. I just right. don't. I, I am too. I am too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I joked about in journey towards squatched him that I said, yeah, I mean, I, I'm against killing one, but if I was starving, I'd hammer one like a flank steak. <laughs> if, if 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 I could, yeah, like I could, like I can hammer a sasquatch with a flank. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Yeah, you know, a, a tiny one, mm-hmm. but, you know. But um, so that's what kind of the the story revolves around, and uh, I'm pretty happy with it. I mean, it, it, it's it's doing better than I thought it would. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it's, I've had it up almost two months now on Amazon. It's also available on, at squatchfilms.com. Uh, 
and it was it was a lot of work, dude. Writing and then and then getting an actual crew, um, people with experience of actually shooting movies, and um, we shot it in ten days in Northern California uh, near the town of Willits, which is about an hour and a half north of San Francisco, where really the first forests start in Northern California. So it was close enough. Some of the actors who were in the film lived in the Bay Area, so it was relatively easy for them to get up there. Uh, a logistical nightmare at times, but uh, got it done, edited it, and yeah, put it out the uh, first week of August. I, I was going to ask you, I mean, if you don't like to, I can take it out, but um, Jason, yeah. Jason Sutherland, you, you're, pretty, yeah. you're pretty much playing yourself on that, aren't you? Yeah, no, no, no you don't take this out. No, other people have said that. I figured that was my best chance to not totally suck in the role. Just don't, don't I mean, I had taken acting classes in college, and um, I had a small part, when I was a comic, I had a small part, one of Bobcat Goldthwait's films, uh, Shakes the Clown. Mm-hmm. I, have, like, I have like three, four lines in there. Wow, I have, like, to go, I have to go back and check that one out. Yeah, Shakes the Clown. I played the floor director of the evil clown, Binky the, <laughs> Binky the Clown. Um, it's later in the film. And um, so, yeah, I, thought, I wanted to be in it, and I felt confident enough with it, because I was basically playing myself, right? So... Uh, and so luckily I had uh, a lot of other good actors in there. Um, and I, I am a SAG member, so it, on that whole nightmare, if you have to deal with the union, holy God, I don't even want to go into that. But uh, like the, the, the lady who played my wife, Lorna Larkin, uh, is a really good Irish actress. She was, is the wife of uh, a cinematographer, Mark David. Okay. So it was all these people who knew people who knew and, and then found some, like the guy who played, I thought did a really good job. And, he, and I found him online, dude, at, at backstage.com. If any budding, budding uh, uh, film directors out there, I think it's a great resource. Go to backstage.com, man. People who just independently, although he is a after a, or a SAG after a guy as well. But this way, you're re- if you really want to be specific about your casting, you can find people. And I found uh, Mark Sivertson, who plays. I loved, Terry, I loved him so much. I was yeah, that he he was so uh, he did a great job, and uh, I remember I was really when I was writing the script that part that speech he gives about why he's and again I don't want to reveal anything, but right, you know what what's his connection to everything? I just thought he did just a just a great job. So I was really lucky to have him and and uh, Johnny Dowers uh, who played my old buddy Brian from college, my characters. He was great. And then also J. John Billier, who played um, the quote-unquote bad guy. That he, he played there. a good bad guy. You know, yeah, I, I was, was going to say, putting him in a, a, a sleazy vest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he totally did. He, he nailed it. I, I saw him on, again, backstage.com, dude. I went there, and I, he was in some movie. I go, oh, yeah, he can play. He can play an asshole really well. Which I think the irony of all that is is that usually people who can play assholes really well are usually the nicest people. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. N- no, because I'm, real, because real assholes aren't insecure enough in themselves to play an asshole. Yeah. Because they think, I don't want people to think I'm an asshole. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You already are. are. <laughs> right. So um, <clears throat> he did great. And everybody, all the, all the, 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 the day players, uh, I was really happy with. So it was, it was really fun. If we, when did we shoot that? May... Uh, May of last year, May of 21, 10 days, and then the, the long editing process began, and and uh, yeah, now it's done. So, so mm. do, do you want to see a sequel, Robert? Yes, I do. I actually okay. do. But um, I was going to ask you, like before we go into that, I was going to yeah. ask you, were some of these characters based on real life Bigfoot researchers in the field. Yeah, like No, was, you know what some people no I would say the only closest thing is is and I hope he I hope he didn't feel this way other than in a philosophic sense. <laughs> it's like I worried as I wrote this because, you know, um Brian Brown, who I totally love, this guy inspired me to go into Kickstarter uh, stuff when I was doing my hiking films and then he asked me to co host the Bigfoot show with him for many years. But he, he, I guess, to a degree, not his personality, but that he he he's he was. I haven't talked to him in, in a couple of years, but I, I, but I assume he's still pretty much pro kill. 
uh, and not in a malicious way. He just he goes from the theory of you know like well we'll save the rest of them, and I counter right. that by saying well if they're real they've already done a good job of surviving. So why if there's so few of them why do we need to kill one? That's why I thought hopefully it would inspire <clears throat> the film would inspire scientifically minded folks to maybe try to come up with a method not just for Sasquatches but for ways where you don't have to kill an animal in order to prove it exists. I just think it's it's just kind of it seems it's a, it's, it's a little callous, you know. I mean, yeah. I get it. You think you're saving it, but too I think too often in, in our history as a species, we just we look at ourselves as you know the the uh, the bosses of everything, so we can do whatever we want, you know. And it's it's kind of messed up. So right in my opinion. Um, so other than that, no. I, I mean, I'm trying to say it's a really good question. There weren't. I mean, other than the Arkansas boys. Yeah. Oh no, that was just I just picked. Okay. I just picked Arkansas. I hope I didn't offend anybody. No, 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 no. I was just I was offended. No, I'm just <laughs> where, are, you know, Robert? Where are you? Where are you located? Are you in Texas? Yes, I'm in. I'm in North North Texas. Uh, gotcha. Did all my research uh, with you know Luke Rose TBRC. Did stuff in cool. Oklahoma, Arkansas, you know East Texas, uh, Louisiana. So I've been all around. I I even been up to. Uh, New Comerstown and uh, did some stuff with Don Keating and uh, Mark Mark yeah. DeWorth. Met met Larry Lunn. Uh, oh yeah, good. M- Monty Ballard. A lot a lot of people. Eric Altman. Bunch of people. So yeah, you know I've been around a while. You know since the late nineties, early two thousand. So yeah. Well, it's still a great mystery. I said you know you mentioned uh, Don Keating. Boy, I, I, dude, I'm still that that. You ever see his that bizarre video he got? Yes, that? I, I was at, that. He, he actually took us out there. He took us out there and showed yeah, us exactly yeah, where it's at. Yeah, and I was like, that is because Don is is a straight arrow. He is. A, he is. There is no way that guy is hoaxed anything. And I'm like, what the hell is that? It was like it's so it's it's again light colored mm-hmm. and what it, 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 it's such a trippy video. It it's is. so trippy to me. And he, he and didn't I, even know he got it. He didn't even know he got right. it. So. And then he looked at it later, and he see, and it's like, that. I love that mystery. I think that that's a really cool yeah. one. So, yeah, no, I hope I didn't, anybody listening from Arkansas, I just, uh, maybe, yeah, I guess, may, may, I don't even know if he's, I don't know, but who's the guy who's the, like the worst hoaxer of all time? Biscardi. Uh, uh, Tom Biscardi. Tom maybe, Biscardi maybe and uh, Rick, Rick Dyer. Yeah, those guys. Yeah, are, those clowns. Evil. Mm. Evil it clowns, totally. Just just uh <laughs> grifters. And so not shakes um, the clown though. <laughs> yeah. What's that? I said not shakes the clowns though. <laughs> no, no, exactly. So um yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else if, no, I just you know, a lot of the I, I wanted I was hopeful that the dialogue in the film would be relatively intelligent. And a, a lot of things that I'd thought of in relation to uh, Bigfoot and the search for, and so I, I usually hate films where they just have a character that's oh he's the dumbass and he's a you know you always I think you, people generally are smarter than you'll give them credit for yeah so why not write dialogue that's interesting hopefully unique. And uh, oh, I want a, a quick shout out to Brad Fowler, who was great in the film. He was the ranger. Yes. Yeah, he's the guy who had the sight. I I met up with him because he had had a sighting. His character in the film, and I remember as we were shooting, he he was ad libbing a lot. And I remember at the time, I thought, oh, dude, you're being too goofy. And I'm like, and then when I got in the editing room, I go, thank God he did all that, because it wasn't so much. I didn't think I was sucking that bad, but. It just added little moments of lightness that I think helped the film. I was gonna say uh, you you guys had like a connection and y'all were yeah like, like he was telling you about your backpack and your gun. <laughs> you go hey you gonna go you <laughs> forget was, your gun, dude. That, that was totally that was totally an ad lib. He said to me he goes he just goes dude because I had I had left my backpack back and he just incorporated goes dude where's your backpack and then I you know he went, oh. <laughs> yeah, I think I, so I cut it yeah in the original I, I yell it. Totally loud, but I say uh, I, I say I say that I drop a few f bombs in, in the film anyway. So I, why add a blatant one? I thought it works kind of funny. You cut me off mid f bomb, <laughs> uh, but Brad's great. I hope to uh, if there is a sequel, I really hope he's available to do it would, right. because he, I, he would be. I, dude, I've actually written like twenty five pages 
of another story that I kind of like. No, I can't give any spoilers, but it's it's um, uh, I'm pretty happy with it. We'll we'll see if I uh, keep going. It's just it's just it's, uh, yeah. It's just a lot of it's just the money to get it going. You know, right. it's like mm-hmm. so I got to see how this thing does, and it is doing better than I thought it would do. Well, good. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, because yeah. I, I actually I didn't rent it. I bought it. So, oh, dude, dude. More importantly, did you leave a review? I did actually. Thanks, but I, I did actually. I did. I did say. I did state it was Al, Alfred Hitchcock ish. Oh, thanks. So yes, uh, it is. Yeah, I. I just like the. I like. Yeah, the, I just like films that can. You know, like I, Blair Witch was a great example. Mm-hmm. It's great. You, you know, it's a lot of suggestion. It's like you hear this, and so the, yeah, the imagination, the, the greater terrors. You know dwell in the imagination of the viewer that if you blatantly put it out on on the screen um so i believe but yeah we'll we'll uh it was a good it was a good storyline i was like the most interesting story because i i don't watch a lot of bigfoot movies i watch very very few and that one this one caught my eye because it was interesting story that normally you would normally see in a movie Mm-hmm. And yeah, I I, I, yeah, I tried to do that. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you you took it that way. I just, and dude, I'm a total movie junkie. I've seen, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of movies in my life. Just ask my girlfriend. I mean, mm-hmm. I watch movies like all the time. And I just, and I'm a really tough critic. I'm just so brutal. But I think that's good. And you have to apply it to yourself too. You have to go. You know, a lot of times when you're writing, what you start with is you know what you don't want because I saw it in this movie, I saw that in this movie. Mm-hmm. What would be a little twist on that? Okay, oh yeah, maybe this. I don't ever remember seeing something like that. And then you want to have that, but at the same time, it's got to be. This is the trick: is to be surprising, but it's also got to be plausible. Right. Uh-huh. When you start, how, how many movies are you watching? Going, oh, uh, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what. That's dumb. It's or or you, or you throw too much. They throw so much in it to, again, and then, it, and then it because I think the more plausible it is, then truly, especially with a drama or a horror film, it is more horrifying or more dramatic because wow, that really could happen, maybe, as opposed to you know, a lot of CGI shit thrown in with um, crazy potentials that just don't. You know, hit you, and you may not even be. I think a lot of people aren't even aware of it at the time because they're not. If they're not like a huge film fan like I am, where they're watching and analyzing at the same time, mm-hmm. they kind of come away. From, I don't know. I just don't think the film was good. But I bet if they go back and they look, the reason is because it didn't. Um, it wasn't that relatable. It wasn't. It wasn't like oh, that really could happen. It was too fantastic, if you will. In fact, um, the the movie. The, the movie I thought of the most while I was writing this, oddly enough, was one of my favorite movies of the last 20 years is No Country for Old Men. Love mm. that movie. I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, that movie. Why is that movie so good? It's because it's, I kept thinking, well, there was a little parallel in the sense of like two people heading toward a, a shared, like in that movie, it's uh, the psycho guy mm. and Tommy Lee Jones are both trying to get to Josh Brolin. Mm-hmm. So, in this sense, I used like my character and then um, John's character, the the, the pro kill scientist, both trying to get to the apparent Sasquatch mm-hmm. as quickly as possible. And it's just that it's, it's so gritty that movie, uh, No Country for Old Men. And I, I just kept thinking, like using that as an example. Well, with the Coen brothers, if they were making a movie about Bigfoot, would they have done this? Would they? Would they have? And then using that and. And I don't know. I just think that that's a that I think that's a good way to hopefully come up with something good. It was good. Uh, did Unverified win any, win any awards? You know, it did. I entered it in a bunch of you know not like super well known uh, uh, festivals, but it got like it was an official selection of the Monster Flick Awards for this year. And then the one I was really I was really happy with was this uh, festival out of Toronto called the thriller slash suspense festival and it won best feature for wow. august which again <laughs> of that month you know maybe i was the only film that entered uh <laughs> no I, um i but no they were really cool and i did a podcast with them and um 
I, I was really honored about that. And then I, a couple other ones I went, one I was uh, best screenplay. I forgot the name. Wait a minute. Let me, I just happened to have my computer here. Wait a minute. I, uh, I got, if it gives me an opportunity to brag about, uh, brag. Do it. Do it. Uh, Do it. <laughs> there we go. Brag. Uh, b- 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 uh. Oh, wait, another review came in. Wait a minute. Hopefully it's good. Read it. Read um, it. It'll, it'll be a. Uh, I, I don't time. know. Well, they're not. I can, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, no, that's good. That, that's good. So, you know, it's so. Oh wait, yeah. Oh, this was cool. Jacob Barr writes, "Great thriller film. This movie kept me at the edge of my seat, waiting to see what was going to happen next. Hopefully, a sequel will happen." Mm. Thanks, yeah. Jacob. There Barr. you go. There you go. That was nice. You guys aren't Jacob Barr, are you? But no, you no. I, I went. I, I wrote mine as Robert Robert Jesse Dominguez. So. Thank you, dude. No problem, uh, man. So anyway, yeah. Well, oh, here was the. Oh, then wait a minute. Yeah, what are finalist best screenplay official selection? And then there was like one other one. I think it was like the the the, fil- the monthly film awards. But you know, it, like takes place in Croatia or something. So I, I, you know, I don't know. It's I, I didn't think it's not the kind of film that's not going to get into the Cannes Film Festival or Sundance anyway. So, but I, but I'm honored that these uh, guys. Uh, uh, I got picked in some of these, so that that's nice. It is. It is nice, and I'm. I was super happy. I was. Just, I was going to ask you how. How did you? Because because you reached out to me, and I was. I was floored whenever you did. How How did you find? Yeah, it? you know what I did. I said, well, you know, I kind of. I think I'm too much of a, a one man band. I, I just always been that way. I make my. I edit them. I you know when I did my hiking documentaries, so I just. Because I don't, you know, I don't have, at this point in my life, I don't have a job job. So I've got all this other stuff. But I want it, I'm very, I like things to be done the way I want them to be done. I don't like to, like, hand it over to somebody and then hopefully they do a good job. Yeah. So um, I went and I just looked. I did, I Googled Bigfoot podcasts. Uh Uh-huh. And yours came up on a list somewhere. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So So that's how, yeah, I, I think... Who was, I think you're the third I've done. Third, the, who's the guy who does it? It's a, it was pretty cool. The one about story, he's like, my Bigfoot encounter was, uh, and it's, and what's his name? He was a really cool guy. He was really, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I can't either. And, it, and if it's but, like, if I think who who it is, I, I'm not going to push him because he does well okay. already. So, <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, you get, so, that's right, dude. because well, uh, I because I, I do Bigfoot Club, and then my I have a buddy named Matt Knapp. He does Bigfoot Crossroads. His his show does a little bit. You know, his does a lot better than mine. But he's been doing it since he was doing it whenever it was on Blog Talk Radio. So he's been do- he's been doing his a while, and so his podcast I push, and I and, you know he pushes mine, and so we kind of collaborate a lot. So you know both. Of us. All right. So how long can it be before I could uh, do his? <laughs> I could I could reach out to him like tonight and say, hey, Scott oh, yeah, Scott wants dude. to be on your show. So I mean, he's I, I would love that, and if, if we could time it so at least you get. I mean, not that you know I'm in great demand on podcasts or people to to watch or anything, but. Uh, you know what? Yeah, it would be great. I will. I will. I will reach them tonight, and I'll. I'll, I'll let you know tomorrow. So cool. That's awesome. But um, dude. before you go, before you yeah. go, well, uh, well, uh, before you do uh, that, okay, go ahead, Steve. I, I have to ask, and I and I see it on your IMDb, and you know, you kind of you kind of skipped it, and oh, did you actually? Were you on, on Naked Gun? Yes, I have a small. <laughs> I was in. Um, yeah, Pete Siegel, who directed that film. Uh, what? How did I know Pete from? Pete directed a pilot I did like in the early '90s. I can't remember what it was. Fox Across America. So I got a traveling talk show pilot or something. Yes, yeah, so if, if you look near the end of the film, when <laughs> when when Leslie Nielsen is trying to stall for time. And he's like, he's, because they're looking, there's a bomb in one of the envelopes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and so he, he, he's like reading off a prompter, but then he starts ad-libbing just to stretch on time. And he's, he goes something, something along the lines that he says, uh, and then uh, the uh, winds for save the dolphins. But, you know, we have to eat too. So if a few <laughs> dolphins get killed anyway, and you hear one person clapping in the audience. And it was you. It to me. It cuts to me clapping. <laughs> 
because <laughs> you're. It's, it's some kind of anti tuna or anti dolphin <laughs> line, and then, and then I, lo- I look, I look around, and I notice no one's. Uh, no one else is clapping it, and I very much. So I now know because I actually love those movies. I yeah. now know now that uh, who you are now. So thank you. I just love yeah. how you don't toot your own horn, uh, and you were well, you were you saying know. you were saying like all the movies that you did, and you skipped that one. I know. I was I all like, it was wow. it's such a small, but yeah, I was. I'm really um, honored to have been in this because those those were great films. I mean, they're so. I, I mean, and if you've never seen. Did you ever, you know, the original, Leslie Nielsen did a show, and you can still get them somewhere, called Police Squad? Yes, I did see yeah. that. Yeah, I have, I have not, but I, w- I would want to see that, because yeah. I love that type of humor. Oh, it was the first, it was, they were like really the first ones, and I think it might have been, I think it was, right, first, well, first he did Airplane, right? Yes, uh, uh, yes, Airplane. yes. And he was so great, and, then, and I think that Police Squad came out after that. We'll do it too, and then it did horribly, ratings-wise, but it was... I think it was the character in that that inspired the Naked Gun films, and yeah, they were. Yeah, I love that stuff too. And it's good stuff. Well, I I, I appreciate it. I I remember whenever uh, was it Robert was telling me about it. He was like, "Oh yeah, he was like he was also on Naked Gun." I go, "Wait, what? What?" <laughs> I had to look it up. I was like, "Okay." And then when you were saying your movies, I was like, "Go ahead and say it." And you didn't say it. I was like, "Man, I hope IMDb didn't get this wrong." <laughs> So yeah, I, I had to ask. I had to ask. No, no, hey, dude, that, that's cool. No, that was, uh, yeah, that was fun. And by the way, when you see that clip there, we, yeah, Leslie Nielsen was not there that day. That was all just crowd reaction days. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's it's just uh, it was Pete, I believe, the director. He's on a ladder, and he's like, so he would be like at um, uh, where Leslie Nielsen was, and he's just directing to us what to do. Okay, now give me, uh, you're all upset, or you're laughing wildly, or something like that. And <laughs> yeah, it's just, just like a half day of work, but it was uh, a lot of fun. Yes, it was, that's a, that's, that's a great story. That's, you, should yeah. def- you should definitely toot your own horn every once in a while. So yeah, uh, I, was, I was on a small, yeah, I was on Naked Gun, yeah, do it. Yeah, well, I don't know. See, that's just it, it's weird. Because I guess it depends on where. I mean, I've had a, I've, I've been fortunate in my life. I've been able to do a lot of fun, cool stuff. But it's like you come on a Bigfoot guy, and I'm serious about it. So I, you can even hear when I was telling you that I did stand up. I mean, I was a comic for 12 years. So it's not something you want to come out of the get right out of the gate with. Hi, I'm Sky Ari, and uh, I was a comic for 12 years. Let me tell you about my Bigfoot story. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I will say this on your movie because uh, I'm not going to lie. We just saw it. Like, well, right you, no, you just oh, saw it. I, it was your third time. Yeah, it was my third time watching. I, it, so. I just saw it. And I'm a little late in the game. I have twin boys, so forgive oh, me. Okay. On that. But I did see it. I just want to say, without saying anything, there is yeah. a horrible movie that I absolutely shit on completely. Mm-hmm. And it's not yours. I'm, don't, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it, didn't mean it like that. But it's not yours. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a movie, it's on sci-fi, and I always forget the name, but I, I can't remember if it's Peter, Peter Fonda or the actor that plays um, on Aliens, uh, the android. Uh, bit, the oh, guy. Lance, Lance Hendrickson. Yeah. yeah, he's. I think it's one. It's either Peter Fonda or him that are the lead. And yeah. without really spoiling it, like without spoiling yours, yeah. like his his daughter's missing on a, a plane crash. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I know what big, you're talking this about. Bigfoot is like on a horror, like horror, like horror rampage where he's just like killing, mm-hmm. killing all these people that were a part of the plane. Yeah. And then they have this horrible outcome ending of you know why he did what he did, and you're like, yeah. you're supposed to accept it. You executed it very well on this without oh, doing that. <laughs> well, I like I, I said, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. the, the way you executed it, you didn't have to explain it. You just knew yeah. with one yeah. picture. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're like, oh, okay. That's what's what's going on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so it's funny you mentioned. You know, Lance Hendrickson has been like in uh, three or four Bigfoot films. He's yes. kind of the king of of like B movie Bigfoot films. You look like he's been in a lot of them. And I was actually lucky enough. I met him once when these the folks who I knew, friends of mine, who were in, in like three of my uh, hiking films about the Pacific Crest Trail. I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and made four movies about it. Mm-hmm. And so I go over to their house one day to just, to shoot. I think I was might have been taping something for one of the movies. And there's friggin' Lance Hendrickson. Turns out he's a neighbor. This is out in like Agua Dulce, uh, California. And he was like the nicest guy. Totally cool. 
totally different from a lot of the characters. He, you know, he, he speaking again back to that thing. The guy he can play a real asshole, and he's just like a super nice guy. For <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was him because I, I, him and. I don't know why him and Peter Fonda kind of resemble each other to me. I don't, I don't know why, um, but I remember it's it's one it's either him or another actor that looks like him. And I remember watching this movie. I was like, oh man, this looks like a good movie. And I'm watching it with my cousins. And then I was like, that's it. That's, yeah, that's the ending that yeah. we're supposed to accept. Yeah, I, I was yeah, not, yeah. I was not happy with it. Yeah, there's um, yeah, it's um, yeah. I'm, again, I'm not trying to I, without saying anything about. The ending of my film, right? Yeah, I kind of, I, I, that actual ending was not in the script. It was, it was, um, it was a bit of footage used from her, but I, I liked it. I liked, I just liked because again, again, I, I don't want to go into too much detail. I just, it worked out well for that, and then coupled with the music I picked, I thought I really liked that combo at the end. It was a little, it's a little bit, it's a shift in mm-hmm. the. Um, it's really hard to talk about this without. So, so right, we'll just right. shut up. Just, just hopefully we'll get people. If you're well, listening to this, my God, the name of the film is unverified. Go to Amazon, or right? Squatchfilms.com, and and then if you do go to Amazon, leave a glowing review. I was, mm-hmm. yeah, I was just about to say, where can people go and find your movies? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's up right right now. It's on Amazon and uh, my site. If 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 you're a huge Bigfoot fan and you're you are interested in buying it, it is a couple bucks cheaper at my site. Okay. Like two or three bucks. You should have let me know ahead of time. Right. Thank you by the way for buying it. I really do appreciate no that. No problem. Um and uh yeah, for now. I am gonna when I'm go I'm going on a backpacking trip as I mentioned. Uh, in two days, and when I get back from that, I'm looking into other venues, like maybe also uh, to be Tubi dot com or uh, maybe even iTunes, getting the film on there. So I got to look into what their requirements are. But uh, yeah, I look at it, dude. I look at it this way: you know, this film, just to let anybody be sure, it, it was a hundred and sixty thousand dollar budget on this film. Mm-hmm. So that's you know. Compared to a lot of films, that's that's low. It's, in fact, under SAG after it's called a, it's ultra low budget film. So there's certain things you can do. Give they give you a break as a result, but it's still a lot of money for most people, and including myself. And so I, I look at it this way, man. If I can make my money back on that, like in five to ten years with video mm-hmm. sale, that would be great. That would that would be we more just. Than a, we just interviewed somebody from Australia, uh, Attila Caldi, and he does documentaries. And yeah. he's, I think he's doing his on, at first I think he just did it on Tubi, but now he's doing a second one. He's releasing it in December, so he's doing it on Tubi and iTunes. So, oh, good. Uh, I, I, I hope you can get it on Tubi. I, I really yeah. do. Yeah, no, I, I, I gotta, I've got to research that, and I assume, um, yeah, like Amazon, basically with Amazon, it's a 50-50 split. Right. Whatever, they take half, and I get the other half. So it's just all about how many people end up watching it and over time and or buying it like the fine Robert, uh, your host, this <laughs> evening, or co-host this evening. Um, so uh, it, and they make great, you know, uh, stocking stuffers, folks. That's all Absolutely. I'm saying. It's hard to fit a digital file in a stocking, but try because uh, I need to make another movie. Scott, thank you so much for coming on. I yeah. I am I am super honored because, like I said before, you were like an inspiration to me when I first got into Bigfoot. And when you reached out to me, I was like, I go, holy shit, Scott, <laughs> Scott is messaging me. So, and, and oh. thank you, thank you for making that uh, Bigfoot conference uh, less boring. Oh, oh thank <laughs> as, you. As, hey, as also, a kid. Just, just to guy, just to let you guys know, if you're, or if you want to let your. Um, viewers know as well i just i'm going to be at the uh the bigfoot film festival in december there in jefferson texas mm. are you really yeah i just i know craig from way the hell back yeah because, yeah the texas bigfoot conference. Craig, craig and i were on the tbrc together so yeah so um yeah the show again we're going to show and verified on saturday well 5 15 i think it is so yeah so I might, be, I might be there. I might be there for cool, that. Man. 
so I get to meet you. Yeah. Again. <laughs> there you go. Scott, oh. hey, I, we would love to have you back on whenever whenever you want to, and I'll, I'll reach out to Matt tonight to see uh, what's his schedule look like, and then I'll reach, I'll reach back out to you. So, so um, I'm super happy. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome, man. You guys have a good night. You, you too, too man. man. Bye. Bye-bye.